Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of our Questions and Answers show. Today is February the 23rd. It's a Saturday. We've got a load of questions that you guys have uh, added into the comments section of our last episode over the last two weeks. I think I want to, we're going to try and do these every two weeks going forward. I think every week is uh, taking up a lot of time for me uh, where I can do some other stuff. So I think every two weeks is pretty good. So uh, you know the drill. If you've got questions, Put them in the comments and feedback section of this particular episode, and I will try my best to get to them uh, next time. If you don't hear me answer your questions, probably means it has been answered or asked and answered before, or maybe it's just way too in-depth to cover on a show like this. And one thing I do want to point out, make sure you guys are listening to these shows, because what I'm getting a lot of is that you guys are asking questions for stuff that's already been asked and answered in the same show that you're commenting on. So Pay close attention, all right? I know these are long, but uh, get comfortable, get a beverage, hunker down, and listen in, right? So anyway, let's get started. So from 81 Peabody, hey, Pete, if you haven't done so already, how about a top 10 BTO songs? I think we can do that. I will add that to my list. I love Bachman Turner Overdrive. From Todd Stevens. Uh, one more, Pete, ever enjoy the band Tease? A great story, a really good high school band. They never played bars in Canada. They got an album out, sold okay here, went ballistic in Japan, leading to a 10-day sold-out headlining stadium tours and a live album release. One hit single upon return, and all of a sudden ACDC opened for them a few times. Uh, I have the live album. That's really all I have by them. And I'm not nuts about it. It's okay. I know a lot of people like really talk about how great of a band they were and how great that live album is. I picked up a few years ago. It's good. Uh, I don't think it's that great. Maybe I need to revisit it, but I, you know, I'm usually a pretty good judge of hearing something one or two times and, you know, getting it. And I just, I didn't really get a lot from that. But I know there's a lot, especially a lot of people up in Canada, love that band and that live album. From Lisa T, what is your opinion of Ian Anderson's solo album Divinity's Twelve Dances with God? Yeah, it's great. Uh, I love the kind of mystical whimsical kind of enchanting quality of that album. I think that was uh, for a lot of people that was a chance to hear Ian do something really different and I dig it a lot. I like those those couple of solo albums that he did. You know, right around that I forget the name of the there's another one in particular that I'm drawing a blank on, but uh yeah, good stuff. Good stuff to kind of hear a more kind of classical folky version of Tull, right, without the guitar crunch, with a lot of flute and all sorts of different instruments. Really cool stuff. I like it. And, you know, <clears throat> seeing as Ian's voice has not been very good over the last, like, 20 years, uh, not surprising he would want to go in that direction. I'm actually surprised he's not done more of that sort of thing. From Todd Stevens, Pete Aram, ever hear of Canada's one album prog rock group, Wonka, the Orange Album? Try Say No More. It's all over the spectrum. Six and a half minutes of wacky deliciousness. Terry Brown produced it. Wrong time, wrong style disease these guys had, sadly. Uh, you know what? I had never heard them before, so I went and listened to a couple tunes. Uh, I, I like them. That's pretty good stuff for me. It's kind of, I kind of hear like a little a little bit of Blue Oyster Cult, some purple, and maybe the tubes. You know, the kind of the weirdness. I listened to three songs. Uh, one of them was the one you mentioned was pretty wacky in spots. The other two were more kind of like serious type of stuff. That's why I mentioned the BOC, Blue Oyster Cult and Purple. But uh, apparently that has either never been released on CD or it's like long out of print or whatever. But um, pretty cool. Wonka the Orange album. Check it out, guys, if you have it. From Jamie Laszlo. <clears throat> so what is your take on reggae music? Since college, I've always liked Bob Marley's legend now, but in 2001, I met my wife, who is from Kenya, and over the last 18 years, she has introduced me to other reggae artists like Peter Tosh, Don Carlos, and Steel Pulse. I've also dived deep into Marley's discography and found out a lot of his best songs were not even hits. Um, I, you know, I like, I have like, I think, two Bob Marley hits collections, something like that. I know I definitely got the one. I, thought, I, thought I, had, I think I have two. And I like the Marley stuff. You know, all those hits are great. I got to be honest, I haven't dove any deeper than that. And I've heard some Peter Tosh and Steel Pulse here and there. But <clears throat> overall, I'm not a big reggae guy, although I don't mind it. Uh, and I certainly, you know, I, I find a lot of fun to pop on Bob Marley in the summertime, whatever. But um, beyond him, I really haven't gone too much further. So it's, uh, you know, reggae overall is not really my cup of tea. But I, Marley's classic, right? He's just got so many great songs. So he kind of, he almost like transcended the genre in a way 
um, or he, he actually is the genre <clears throat> or was the genre, but, um, his just songs was just so great, so catchy and so memorable. So, but I haven't gotten any deeper as far as reggae goes from Aaron Proctor. Just entering the sea of tranquility world. Well, welcome. Uh, but as a Royals fan, boo and music nut, this is a fun place to be. Yeah. Rub it in, buddy. Uh, my question is, what albums have you heard that you thought changed the landscape of popular music? When I heard the guitar tone of No More Tears by Ozzy, I knew it changed things. Metallica's Black Album, Nevermind, Zeppelin IV, etc. I would love to hear your thoughts on albums that raise the bar for things to follow. <clears throat> well, I mean, these are just my opinions, right? Um, I think, going back a ways, uh, obviously those first two Black Sabbath albums, Game Changers. Uh, as far as Zeppelin goes, I'd even go further back. I'd say they're either of their first two albums. Those were game changers too. Uh, you know, Cream, Cream's first two albums, Judas Priest, Sad Wings of Destiny, and Stained Class. I mean, that was, you know, there was heavy stuff before that. You know, Priest and, uh, I mean, Sabbath and Zeppelin and Purple and Uriah Heep and Sir Lord Baltimore, so on and so forth, Budgie. But I think, you know, when Priest released those, their second and third albums, man, and fourth albums that was you know you could say the birth of metal started with those other bands i mentioned but metal as we would know it to become in the late 70s and then throughout the 80s and so on i mean that's priest right there man um as far as metallica's black album i mean for me that that wasn't changing the landscape of anything they changed the landscape with ride the lightning that to me was that was a game changer album um what else did i jot down here deep purple and rock you know, uh, Pantera Cowboys from Hell, that kind of, you know, that was a big eye opener for what was to become in the 90s, right? Uh, how about starting talking about the 90s? How about, you know, Dream Theater's image and, Images and Words, right? That things were never the same after that, right? The floodgates of progressive metal were forever to be opened and never to be closed again. So that's some game changer stuff right there. From Nick's Texans fans, number one. Hey, Pete, thanks for getting to my question last week. Appreciate it as always. You're welcome. Who, in your opinion, is the most underrated musician at every standard rock band position? Vocals, guitar, bass, drums, and keys. All right, well, I went with um, kind of a mix. A lot of newer guys. Well, some guys who have been around for a while and some more recent, more recent, in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, on vocals, there's a guy who, man... I love him. I think he's just absolutely great. He's a hell of a nice guy, too. And I don't think he gets the recognition he deserves. Russell Allen from Symphony X and, you know, X number of other projects, man. I think Russell's a fantastic singer. I mean, you know, people go to see him every holiday season in Trans-Siberian Orchestra and love him doing that. The Symphony X is a very popular, but you just never, you know, when people talk about the great vocalists of today, nobody ever brings him up for whatever reason. He's one of the best, in my opinion. Uh, keyboards. How about my buddy Eric Norlander? Probably the, one of the greatest keyboard players going today. It's like, you know, this guy should be mentioned when you talk about, you know, Emerson and Wakeman and Lord and, you know, all those greats. He's just fantastic and he can kind of do it all. Um, another guy, underrated. Um, as far as guitar players, man, how about Brian May from Queen, for fuck's sake? I mean, one of the most underrated guitar players of all time, one of the most original players of all time. Um, you know, and I know a lot of people, yeah, he's a great guitar player, but man, did you, did you ever see him in the polls over the years? You know, when, when you, you, you know, you look at all the guitar magazines and you got, you know, Vi and Satriani and Page and, you know, all the usual suspects. It's like, where's the Brian May covers? Great player. Uh, as far as drummers go, you know, I'm not a, I'm not the best guy to ask about drummers, but um, one guy I always really respected, and I think he's a great player. And he's a fantastic player, one of my favorites of all time. And again, probably not a guy that, you know, when you talk about the drum greats, really gets mentioned much. Uh, Steve Smith from Journey and Vital Information and John Luke Ponte. I mean, what a fantastic player. Fantastic player. And as far as bass players, I mean, there's so many. <clears throat> a guy I always really loved, and we're going to the jazz side of things now, that I think never really got his due, John Patitucci who plays and has played for many, many years with uh, Chick Corea's Electric Band, and he's done lots of solo stuff, and he's appeared on numerous other albums by a lot of other artists and what have you. A fantastic player, fantastic player that, again, never gets mentioned when you talk about the hot bass players. From Bill Goodwin, hey, Pete, did you post 
or just lurk in any band forms back in the day? If so, which ones? For me, it was Sabotage and Fate's Warning. You know, I was never a big forum poster guy. And I honestly don't think I ever posted in any of those. But, you know, I'm trying to think. Not specific band forms. I, you know, there was, if I remember correctly, wasn't there like a Gentle Giant band form going on way, way back in like the early mid nineties. I may have dabbled once or twice in that, but I honestly, I was never into posting on these band forums. I've never been much of a forum guy. I think the only like, um, music forum that I ever have regularly posted in over the years is the progressive ears, uh, website forum, which is very cool. If you haven't been there, you should go to progressive ears. Very cool place. Um, I've posted in there lots of times over the last God, Close to 20 years, I'm going to say. Probably 15 years. Probably a little longer than that. That's a fun place. A lot of cool people hang out over there. Uh, from Indie Cult 777 Hi, Pete. I appreciate your origins of Sea of Tranquility show. Glad you guys like that. That was fun to do. Uh, much respect for giving your time to a great channel and website. My question is, can you share a few thoughts about the following bands? Emerson Lake and Powell, Sparks, Godly and Cream, and the Alan Parsons Project. And lastly, how about a top 10 Elton John tunes? Uh, let me tackle your last one first. Uh, I would love to do an Elton John top 10 list. Man, is that going to be hard. Whew. i tell you what, I will cons consider doing that. I'm going to see Elton John in a week. Actually, it was a week from yesterday. So um, probably, I'll probably be on such an Elton John, John high after that that I'll definitely want to do one. So I'll put that on my list. Um, <clears throat> I like the Emerson Lake and Powell album. That's a cool album. There's some really good material on there. And, uh, you know, Cozy Powell is one of my favorite drummers of all time. And uh, good match there, I thought. I like the album. A lot of really good tunes. Uh, I've never listened to Sparks, Godly, and Cream, oddly enough. Okay. <laughs> um, I like the Alan Parsons Project a lot. I, those early albums are awesome. You know, Tales of Mystery and Imagination, uh, I, Robot, um, Pyramid is great. Eve is a pretty cool album. Turn of a Friendly Card is awesome. That's the first one I ever bought, actually. Uh, Eye in the Sky. There's a couple others. They're all pretty damn solid. Really good stuff. Uh, another underrated band or project, right? Um, although they are touring now, right? So uh, from the Dallas Space Cowboy. Hi, Pete. Thanks for answering my questions as always. I got two this week. Your thoughts on Ingve Malmsteen's later albums. If I'm not mistaken, you've only talked about him a couple times and only his 80s material. I personally love Facing the Animal featuring the late, great Cozy Powell on drums. Yeah, I mean, um, I haven't kept up with his last couple because he's just got so many damn albums and there's only so much time in the year, right? But uh, Facing the Animal's very good. I, I really like um, the two he did with Ripper Owens. Uh, was that Perpetual Flame and Relentless? Those are really strong. Uh, Alchemy's good. War to End All Wars is strong, um, and I like the album he did with Doogie White also. What's that, uh, Unleash the Fury? I mean, most of Ingve's albums are really strong. My problem always with him, I love his playing, always have, since the Alcatraz days. He just goes through band members and, and more specifically singers like we, you know, change our shirts. It's just, he he's, you know, he's never been able to solidify a strong band for more than an album or two. And I think that has, in my opinion, has hindered his popularity over the years because, you know, a lot of people resonate and latch on to bands, okay? Strong band lineup where you've got, you know, strong singer that they can identify with, a guitar player, drummer, so on and so forth. And it's always the Ingve revolving door show. And he's, he's really only been able to keep like loyal fans who are like guitar players and fans of guitar music. And I think because he's got a lot of great songs that would appeal to a lot more than just that. But because he changes singers like every fucking album, it's like you can't keep track of, the, of, of him and what he's doing. It's like, so a lot of really strong albums, God, if he would just keep a singer for like, you know, five years, a decade, whatever. I really thought the partnership between him and Ripper Owens was going to really, you know, move on to something and it never of course it didn't you know and ripper just goes from project to project to project band to band to band um you know doogie white was a good match i thought and you know we i uh just got soto from the 80s and you know so but some really good albums i, I like them you know i personally am not a huge fan of him like singing his own material not that he has a bad voice but it's like again 
it's like he's afraid to give up that spotlight to someone else. But I always thought that Ingve was a very strong singer. Like, could you imagine if Ingve and Jorn Landy could make it work and make like two or three or four albums together and tour together? I mean, you know, two supreme individuals in the music world. And it's just like, I mean, that, that for me, that would be kind of a best of both worlds. I would love to see those two guys do something. Um, and I know they briefly did, but it's, you know, again, nothing lasts with him. It's just crazy. From uh, our buddy Bongalong, just watched the Zappa show. Brilliant. Thank you. I got a lot of positive feedback on that. Mike, we're very appreciative of all your feedback from everybody. Uh, with that in mind, what album or albums would you suggest to someone who knows nothing about Zappa? A primer, if you will. That's a great question. Um, the albums I would recommend, if you have never gotten into Zappa before, but want to get a kind of start into what he's all about, I would suggest these albums, One Size Fits All, Overnight Sensation, Apostrophe, those three albums kind of go hand in hand, uh, but that's that's a, your combination of somewhat accessible Zappa, but also very complex, proggy, jazzy Zappa, okay? It's a little bit of everything there. Uh, I would do uh, Roxy and Elsewhere, and I would throw Hot Rats in there as well. That's where I would start. One Size Fits All, Overnight Sensation, Apostrophe, Roxy and Elsewhere, and Hot Rats. That's a good five to start with. If you like those, <laughs> you have opened up the floodgates, my friends. So, uh, And I'd be happy to give more recommendations. All right, from Vladimir of St. Petersburg. Have you listened to any Humble Pie recently? And which album do you think is the best from this band? I listen to Humble Pie a lot, actually. Uh, my two favorites are you know, Rock On or Smokin'. Um, it's always hard to decide which of the two I like better. They're both really good. But, you know, you can't go wrong with so many of their albums. You know, you got the early stuff, which is kind of like this kind of psychedelic, folky, hard rock thing. Uh, then they moved more into that kind of like, you know, heavy blues rock like we would know from know for them. And then, you know, they kind of moved into kind of, you know, they added some like R&B and soul elements into the whole thing. And But, man, they can kind of do it all. They have you know, a lot of really strong albums, uh, some less so than others. But those two can't go wrong with those top to bottom they're both great from peter brickley <clears throat> have you heard chrome or helios creed lps they are from 1976 and today and are hawkwind related i have damon edge's jacket from cover of blood on the moon rest in peace damon given to me from helios if you're interested i'd let it sell for a thousand dollars with letter of authenticity from helios creed well that's okay i'm not interested in spending a thousand dollars on a jacket, but uh, you enjoy that one. Um, I've heard the X-rated fairy tales album from Helios Creed. That's okay. Um, it's kind of like a more punky, energetic Hawkwind sort of. I could totally see it in that kind of. You know, I'm not sure where they're from exactly, but uh, it's okay. It's kind of like um, Hawkwind light, if you ask me. Uh, Chrome, I have not heard, but. Um, yeah, but they've got they've got a bunch of albums out there. So I think that's one of their older ones, if I remember correctly, early '80s or something like that. From Scott Kilpatrick, hey Pete, few questions. Being a Purple fan, how do you like the Book of Taliesin? I always loved it. I know it's not what Deep Purple ended up being. It's certainly not very hard rockish, more like symphonic rock, but it appears to have a big enough budget to put it to put to it to have an orchestra record it and an overall impressive sound for a band which at the time was not necessarily a huge band. No, they were not a growing band. Yes. Uh, or were they at that time? No, not really. They weren't a huge band at the time. Uh, but they were starting to make a name for themselves. Uh, anyway, Scott says, I don't know, but I love the album and their version of River Deep, Mountain High. Your opinion of this album? Yeah, I mean, it's a solid album. I like the first three Purple albums. You know, obviously not nearly as much as what would come from In Rock and afterwards. But uh, those albums are like a product of their time. They're very psychedelic in nature. There's a lot of pop going on there. You know, it's the band trying to figure out what the hell they want to do, right? But you know, Ring That Neck came from that album. That's pretty indicative of where Purple was going to go. Uh, you know, Anthem is a pretty cool tune. You had Kentucky Woman. Again, they did a lot of covers on those first couple albums. Uh, strong album, I think, you know, but very much of its time. And, uh, you know, enjoyable. You know, pop, Hammond, Oregon, little bits of hard rock, a little psychedelia, a little classical, you know, everything that kind of Purple was trying to figure out early on, but a strong album. Scott's second question. I may have missed it, but have you touched on overrated bands? My opinions of some grossly overrated bands are the Chili Peppers and Beastie Boys, two bands that started out as a party novelty act and remain so without a doubt the Foo Fighters. 
decent enough musicianship for that style, I guess, but zero on songwriting. It just equals a whole lot of unnecessary sound. Your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked about underrated, or I mean, overrated bands quite a few times in recent weeks. Everybody seems to want my opinions on who I think are overrated. Uh, I, you know, I've never been a Beastie Boys fan, ever. I never saw the appeal, to be honest with you. Uh, the Chili Peppers I liked quite a bit when they first kind of came out. You know, those first couple albums? But, man, they just lost me over the years. I Now I I don't even, I have no interest in even listening to that their early stuff anymore. I just, I got burnt out on them. And then over the years, I'm just kind of like, what did I ever really like about these guys? Yeah, I don't know. So I just, I have no use for them anymore. I never really liked the Foo Fighters. Uh, they're extremely popular. I don't, I don't get it. Uh, other bands that I mentioned previously, Pearl Jam is another band, overrated. Big time. Uh, Nirvana, never understood. You know, I, I, I get it that they helped spearhead a movement, a musical movement up there in Seattle. But, man, you just listen to a lot of that Nirvana stuff. And I'm like, what? I just, it doesn't, I don't understand why they're deemed so, like, legendary. It just, it just, for me, it just, they just never clicked for me. Um, Motley Crue. Oh, God. Poison. Ugh. And last but not least... Guns N' Roses. Again, I know there's plenty of you out there who are Guns N' Roses fans. And that's cool. I am not denying, again, how groundbreaking they were. And let's face it, that first album is pretty damn great, right? I don't ever need to hear it again. But I totally get that. My issue with Guns N' Roses is that they basically have made a career living off of that first album. I mean, come on, those couple albums that came afterwards, you know, the Usual Illusion 1 and 2, a ah, couple good songs, but man, it's Drek, anything, and you know, it's like, so now they're, you know, they're back together again, and, you know, which obviously, unless you have Axel and Slash together, right, there is no Guns N' Roses, and, you know, Axel tried for all those years putting up a sham trying to continue on with that band, you knew there was no way that was going to happen. Uh, it's taken them getting back together to all of a sudden bring the Guns N' Roses hysteria back in again. And a great, really good live band. Although the only time I saw them, they were terrible. Um, I saw them at Giant Stadium with Metallica and, and uh, Faith No More. And man, they came on late. Uh, Axl Rose was bitching at the road guys, the roadies, and the stage people and shouting at the fans who were pissed off having to wait an hour plus for them to go on. He was just a total dick and they just sucked. Um, so yeah, so those are my overrated bands <clears throat> from Leaf Siklasi. Hi Pete. Thanks for producing a class a YouTube channel. You are very welcome. Thanks for the kind words. You've highlighted some great record labels. What is your opinion of rock candy records? I got a ton of rock candy records reissues. Um, I think they have just been a really, you know, I mean, some of the quality of some of the recordings, uh, have been a little suspicious. Okay. And not great. But quite frankly, you're going to get that a lot with these, you know, I mean, you know, remember One Way Out Records and uh, this is uh, BGO. I mean, there's all this, so many of these great labels that just resurrect stuff from the vaults. Uh, otherwise, you'd never see this stuff. So I've got a ton of rock candy stuff. In fact, um, I believe, is that, I believe that Barry Goodrow that you see right over there is a rock candy one. Uh, it's one of the more recent ones I've got. But I've got, I've got rock candy shit everywhere. Um, and you know what, they've, if you look, go on their website, I mean, they have reissued so many like hard rock gems from the past that, you know, would be forever out of print if it wasn't for them. So I appreciate labels like them. <clears throat> from Scala Grimmer <laughs> I'm going to screw up your name every week, my friend. Uh, thanks for another very interesting Q&A show. My question this time, I found some articles on the internet about music journalists who seem to hate progressive rock, saying it's pretentious, etc., do you think that in the near future, the media will learn to appreciate Prague for what it is? No, absolutely not. Come on. You should know better than asking that question. Prague has been lambasted and punished by the media for, what, 50 years, 45 years, whatever? Let's face it. The mainstream press and media are never going to embrace progressive rock, folks. It's just not going to happen because to them, it's pretentious. It's overblown. Uh, it, it's every, you know, it, it, it defies all conventional wisdom as far as what a song should be and what music should be. So it, you know, these kind of philosophical questions about people accepting Prague, is it ever going to happen? It's not. All of us who love it will continue to love it. And you know what? At some point you just got to say, then that's good enough because that's really all that matters, right? 
prog rock bands and music, they're, they're, the, the glory days are done. It's never going to be big top selling again. It's just, it's forever going to be simmering in the underground. And, but that's okay. As long as people like us seek it out, listen to it, and, you know, keep the what little of a genre thriving, um, that's really all that matters nowadays. So, but good question, though. From Jeff Splatford, my question would be, what was the worst concert you've ever seen? Nothing against the bands personally. It happens every show, can't be perfect. I've sat through quite a few stinkers myself. What concert were you, and also what concert were you really amped to see and the band just took a huge dump? <laughs> okay, well, I got two great examples. <clears throat> I think it was 88. It's either late 87 or 88. I'm not sure what year it was. I, I went to see a Rat and Poison at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, New York. And Poison were terrible because I didn't like them anyway, but they... Yeah, they opened that show. And then I was looking forward to seeing Rat. I think it was my first time seeing Rat. And they were horrible. You could tell they were all drugged out or drunk or something like that because the, it was sloppy. This, it sounded like shit. And, you know, it just looked like they weren't into it. And this is, you know, Rat had been on a pretty big high for a couple of years, right? Um, and I was just, that easily is the worst concert I've ever seen. <clears throat> so as far as like, a big disappointment of a band I was really looking forward to. Yeah, so I um, I went to see Black Label Society. I've always been a big Zach Wild fan, and I always liked Black Label Society, and I'd seen them a couple times, and they were great live. And this was, God, I'm going to say, two, it was either 2007, 8, or 9. I don't remember the year. It was in New York City. It was at the old uh, the, the Best Buy Theater. I don't even know what the hell it's called now. Um, it was not too long after, um, or a couple of years after Dimebag Darrell was killed. And, you know, they were good friends. Zach and Dime were really good friends. And he was really freaked out about what happened and really depressed about it. And he had then announced this tour and uh, when it came to New York. And he was, for, he was getting really paranoid about something like that happening to him, like someone coming from out of the crowd and killing him. And he was depressed about Dime and all that kind of stuff. And so the day of the show in New York City, and I was there as press, so I was, you know, taking, ready to take pictures down in the photo pit and, you know, do a review of the show and so on and so forth. And it was like an hour after the show was supposed to start and no band and people are getting restless. And I don't even remember who opened up the show. Was it like Crowbar or something like that? I don't remember. But they, whoever it was, they had played like two hours before. And it was like this ridiculously long wait for, you know, the band to come on. And then you started hearing rumblings from other people in the press and people talking about how they had heard rumors that he was really paranoid about this show all day and that he was, wherever he was, hanging out at the hotel and he was drinking up a storm because back then Zach was a huge drinker and he would drink like a shitload of beers before he would go on stage. He was a really, really big beer drinker. And so apparently the word got out that he was like really freaked out about this show and he was drunk as a skunk. So... Finally, they came on, literally like two hours after they were supposed to start or something like that. It was ridiculous. And you could tell his eyes were like bloodshot red, and he was very stiff. Not normal Zach is usually running all over the place and very talkative on the mic and all that kind of stuff. And he was just like very stiff, like going through the motions. But then he just, he played one song, and I forget the name of the song, where he's it's like a piano-driven song. And he just went off and he started talking about Dimebag and he started, and the, all of a sudden the song was like 20 minutes long, him on the piano, and he was just making no sense. And we were all like, what the hell is going on here? It was just kind of surreal. Um, so he was deeply, deeply troubled about all of that whole event, uh, you know, what happened to Dime and his lot in this whole metal world. And, uh, and I think his drinking was getting out of control. Thankfully, he's gotten that under control in recent years. But yeah, that was very strange. And like I said, I was really excited for that concert, and I left walking out like, what the hell just happened here? In fact, I don't even think I stayed for the whole show. That's how bad it was. Um, so, but it happens, right? From Arnaud B., <clears throat> it seems like society in general consider classical and jazz as more elevated, refined, and prestigious art forms than rock. Do you think it's fair? Um, you know, it's just different perceptions. You know, uh, whether it is more elevated and refined, eh, maybe you could say a lot of it is. I think, you know... Jazz is kind of like musicians' music for at least some of it, anyway. And some people, you know, some forms of rock are much more basic. So, you know, whether it's fair or not, I don't know. Uh, but that's like common, common perception amongst most, you know, 
music listeners is that you know you got classical and jazz and i think that's why prog gets a bad rap because it's you know some people see prog as rock bands trying to incorporate jazz and classical elements and be better than normal rock bands right not necessarily the case it's just wanting to kind of push the boundaries a little bit but uh arnav's other question is are you familiar with barry miles and silverlight uh yeah i don't own anything by them but that's some pretty good jazz fusion right very obscure stuff i don't even know if you can get any of those albums or cds i think mean, you can probably find some albums out there cds i think are non-existent but uh yeah barry miles great player from the moogle master hey there pete are you at all familiar with the band's ruins or thinking plague uh, i've been actually listening to and following thinking plague for a long long time they're a very good avant-garde slash prog slash rio you know band from the u.s very cool if you haven't listened to them check them out i had never listened to runes before but i went and listened to a little bit of them uh just for this show um musically they're great that's like kind of really complex proggy math rock sort of thing but or kind of almost zool in in you know in a lot of spots but man then those annoying vocals come in ah that's why i don't like a lot of zool music man i just can't stand the vocals god the shrieking woman singing in you know Japanese or is it Japanese? I think they're here. Yeah, they're an Asian band. Um, yeah, I just uh, once the vocals started, I was just kind of like, ah, turn off. Um, and then the Moogle Master uh, opinions on '60s garage rock. I mean, there's a lot of it out there, right? That kind of '60s psychedelic garage rock. So many bands out there. You you could, yeah, I could spend an hour talking about you know the the underground '60s garage rock scene, man. There's a, you know if you ever want to discover some new music, just go and start searching for obscure albums by 60s, you know, psych bands and what have you. There's just so many of them out there. So many of them. There's a lot of good stuff, too. From all media reviews, blogspot.com, what's going on? Hey, Pete, thanks for answering my question about Live in Europe by Deep Purple. I almost forgot to include how along with jazz and rock, you're right, there's a lot of great funk on that album. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, I consider the cover maybe my favorite album cover ever, actually. Cool. Um... My question for this week, I have a friend who loves the band George Martin of the Beatles worked with called Stackridge. Are you familiar with Stackridge? And if so, what is your take on them? Any favorite albums? You know, I'd always heard the name Stackridge. I'd never actually listened to him. So what I did is I went and listened to parts of their self-titled album and the uh, the Man in the Bowler hat. That's probably pretty cool, right? Well, maybe a little too folky for my normal taste, uh, but there's some little bits of Prague and specifically some Canterbury Kind of quirky Canterbury stuff going on, and uh, a lot of like Beatles style pop. Um, neat band. Um, I may dig into them a little bit further because I, you know, I, I liked what I heard. It's not my normal cup of tea, but um, pretty cool. It was good to kind of discover a band you'd always heard about but never listened to. From Jor Mungander, have you listened to Carfagen's new album? It's great. Uh, well, I hadn't. I, the last album I heard from them, geez, was a long time ago. Um, but I went and listened to uh, Echoes from Within Dragon Island. That's pretty good stuff. Long album. Holy Christ. Uh, it's like 90 minutes long. Um, double album set. But uh, good stuff. And I love the album cover art. In fact, I urge everybody to go on the internet and look up Carfagen. K-A-R-F is in Frank. A-G-E-N. The new album is called Echoes from Within Dragon Island. Amazing gatefold album cover very cool from aaron magram hi pete i agree with the comments about alan white doesn't quite have the energy he once did i suppose although yes his music requires a ton of stamina yeah true uh being a fellow hudson valley resident from saugerties wow very cool uh, i was wondering if you caught them a few years back when they played drama and half of tales which i thought was phenomenal possibly because the set list wasn't the usual suspects and i love both those albums i caught the show at the capitol theater it was so good i had to see them again at the egg in albany the next night they had a different drummer on that leg of the tour who was pretty solid, I thought. Alan White was recovering from back surgery. Yeah, yeah, he has been, yep. Um, although his, you know, his his back must be in, has have been in bad shape for a long time because I've, I've really thought his drumming has really lacked for quite a number of years. But, you know, it's obviously health-related, so, and his age. So, yeah, you know, it's understandable, but, you know, sometimes it's just time to move on, right? Uh, anyway, Aaron was wondering if you caught that tour and if you or anyone remember who was the drummer for them. Thanks and keep up the... Great videos. P.S. Were you drinking a juice bomb on that last show? Yes, I think I was. <laughs> you could tell just from the way the beer looked, huh? Very cool of you. Uh, obviously, you're a Hudson Valley guy, so you you know all about the, the juice bomb craze that's going on. Um, no, I, I did not catch that tour. So I, the last time I saw Yes was at Radio City Music Hall about a year or maybe a little less before Chris Squire died. So it was that tour they did the whole Fragile album, plus you know, a lot of greatest hit stuff. 
And uh, that was a good show. Didn't think it was a great show. I even at that show, I, I, I said to myself, it's cool to see Yes in Radio City Music Hall because I've seen them in so many different venues. But I was like, and while they were good, I thought they sounded a little tired and kind of going through the motions. And, and you know, in hindsight, it was great I got to see them because I you know, obviously can never see Chris Squire again. So it was good to see him that last time. But I thought like Alan White was really slow, you know, ponderous on the drums. I thought, you know, Hal just seemed to be phoning it in. And I thought, uh, you know, John Davison, the singer, it was the first time I'd seen them with him. I thought he was really good, actually. Um, you know, Jeff Downs. I like Jeff. He's a nice guy. I've met Jeff. Um, I love his stuff with Asia. Yeah, I, I personally don't think he's the right guy for Yes. He's just not. He, I, they they kind of need more of like a flashy, flamboyant keyboard player. But, you know, I get it. It's comfortable and, you know, he's whatever. But, uh, but yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't catch him on the drama doing the drama and the tales thing. I would have liked because I love drama. Love drama. From George Dance. Hi, Pete. I was wondering if you ever heard or listened to the music of the cult. Of course. I personally have always found their take on hard rock and metal to be very interesting and maybe even somewhat influential on the music of the 90s and maybe even the hard rock and metal of now. Somewhat. They, I believe, were able to take the new wave a la U2, Bauhaus, and marry it with a good dose of Zeppelin Priest. Although later in their music... Tilted much, much more to the metal and classic hard rock side. Um, yeah, I've always liked the cult. You know, I was big into Sonic Temple, especially. But uh, Electric, I also got into Love. Not as much. Sonic Temple and, the, and Electric were um, two of my favorites. Uh, I like the Ceremony album, which I believe came out after Sonic Temple. Uh, and I did hear, and I have their 2012 release, uh, Choice of Weapon, which is actually pretty damn strong. That might be their last one. I'm not sure if they've released one since then. You know, Billy Duffy, very solid guitar player. Uh, Ian Asbury, gotta love him as a singer, you know, if you love that Jim Morrison style. Can't go wrong there. A really big band. Yeah, I think pretty influential, I think. You know, they, they did definitely do that kind of like hard rock and that, that kind of like Bauhaus thing, or whatever you want to call that. Um, that like kind of like very British style. I, I, it was always hard to kind of pigeonhole the cult into any kind of category. Because they had they, they had that certain element going on that was very, very different. You know, a lot of us who listened to metal, you know, and, and let's face it, at that time, we're talking thrash metal was really popular. And, and, but a lot of people who were into, like, you know, Slayer and Metallica and Exodus and, you know, Testament and Anthrax, blah, 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 uh, Megadeth, were also cult fans. And it was just kind of weird. But there was that one, they were that one band that, you know, weren't nearly as heavy, but were really cool. Uh, and everybody was into them. So... From Niels B. Hey, Pete, love your shows. Always learn something new. Cool. That's what it's all about. What are your thoughts on cover bands? There are a lot of bands who make their living covering other bands. I've been there, seen guys dressed up as ACDC, playing ACDC songs and other cover bands too. I want the real thing. I, would, I want to see bands playing their own songs. I mean, yeah. Here's the deal. <clears throat> if you're a local band nowadays, and I'm specifically talking about the way it is here in most parts of New York. Um, if you're a cover band okay it the interest the problem with cover bands is that most cover bands are playing older music which means that they're probably playing they're wanting to play and cater to audiences who are like probably like my age or maybe a little bit younger and older okay so you're talking like the 40 to 70 year old crowd um the problem is a lot of people in this age group are going out to see live music less, okay, because of various reasons. It's expensive to go out, you know, there's the, the whole drinking and driving thing, the late shows, you know, if you got kids and stuff, it's, it's just, it's hard, right? <clears throat> so I hear a lot of local cover bands around here talking about how it doesn't pay to play out live anymore. So what a lot of them are doing now is they're, they're becoming not just cover bands, but they're becoming tribute bands. So they're going out and there's bands around here, there's bands, there's like a Queen tribute band, there's a Pink Floyd tribute band, there's multiple Zeppelin tribute bands, there's Sabbath tribute bands, there's um, Fleetwood Mac tribute bands, there's, I mean, you name it, Rush tribute bands, Allman Brothers, Santana, you name it. There's all these bands that that's what they do. They specialize in playing those, you know, Leonard Skinner, you know, the songs by a specific band that everybody loves. And a lot of people... Again, in this age group we're talking about, 
They also don't like spending big money to go see when those bands come around and tour and it's $150, $200 a ticket, plus everything else that comes along with a night out at a concert, right? It's hundreds of dollars. So for them, it's like, hey, you know what? If I could just go down to my local you know, bar or restaurant, they got a Santana cover band playing. It's free admission. I'll go have something to eat. I'll listen to the band for an hour and a half. Go home happy. I got to hear all my favorite Santana tunes because I know they're only going to play the, the song, radio songs and the hit songs, right? It's safe. It's familiar. Yeah, you're not seeing the actual band, but you're getting an experience that is, is comfy and cozy, right? So I totally get what you're saying. And, but unfortunately, a lot of these bands we grew up idolizing, they're dying, they're retiring, all this kind of stuff. You know, 10 years from now, the majority of those bands, they're done. You're never going to see them live again. So what are we going to have left? We're going to have left all these continuing bands popping up doing tribute shows to specific artists. Get used to it. That's just the way it's going to be. Uh, I, I highly doubt you're going to see, you know, tribute bands coming up. I mean, and you don't, you really don't see it. You know, how, how many times do you see, are you going to see, uh, you know, tribute bands? And then they're out there, but from acts from the last like 10 or 20 years, very, it's very rare. Most of these tribute bands and cover bands are covering stuff from like the 60s, 70s and 80s for the most part. So I, like I said, get used to it because that's not going away. I, but I totally get you. I, I would much rather go see the actual band, but there's going to come a time where you're not going to be able to anymore because they're, they're, they passed away or they, they retired. I mean, how many of these bands are doing farewell tours now? It's crazy. So get used to it. All right. It sucks. Yeah, but um, it is what it is. From Tim Marciniak. Hey, Pete, thanks for doing the Queen Top 10. You're welcome. Hope you guys like that. That was fun. Uh, as someone who really only knew the greatest hits, I'm having a blast discovering their album tracks. Very cool. I mean, that's, you know, that usually is a trap most people fall into. They go out and they buy a greatest hits from a band that they kind of are a little familiar with. They want to get all the hits and then they're loving it so much. And then they start seeking out other things and they're like, holy shit, there's so much other stuff other than what's on this 12 track greatest hits CD. Of course, I, I fall into that trap, you know, so many times over the years. I can't tell you how many greatest hits I bought to just give, give myself a little, you know, glimpse of a band and figure that'll probably be enough and then I love it so much I start listening to other stuff and I'm like see this greatest hit CD get rid of it I'm going by the catalog I've done it so many times uh, anyway uh, Tim's question is what did you think of the studio album Queen plus Paul Rogers made the Cosmos Rocks I like it um, it basically got ignored and it's a shame because I think it's a pretty solid album. You know, it's not a great album, but it's a solid album. It doesn't really sound like Queen. It's got Paul Rogers on vocals. It's And that's what it should have been, right? Uh, they probably should have just called it something else. But um, it got criminally ignored. And I think it actually is pretty strong out. There's some good tunes on there. And, you know, that was it, right? At the end of that lineup. So uh, from David Mitchell. Hey, Pete, Dave Mitchell here. Love your show, and thanks for helping me to slowly liqu liquidate my checking account. Buying your recommendations. <laughs> Glad to be of service, my friend. <laughs> I do the same thing. So, you know, you guys give me a lot of good recommendations, too. Uh, my question is, what are some of your most significant musical experiences? In other words, songs that changed your life the first time you heard them. Some examples of mine, without being too elaborate, would be the first time I heard The Beatles, first time I heard Paint It Black by The Stones, first time I heard Black Dog by Led Zeppelin, first time I heard Roundabout by Yes, Killer Queen by Queen, so on and so forth. In other words, songs you heard the first time that got inside your internal fabric that changed your life. Keep on rocking. All right. Um, I'm going to take an approach more from an album perspective than songs. I've always been an album guy. I don't think songs in particular um, change my life more than just whole albums. But, you know, I'll point out some. I'm going to name some albums. I'll point out some songs. So, you know, first of all, Kiss Alive. And it doesn't even matter. Like, I, there's no sense in me because when I, the first time I heard that album, that, like, you know, it was like... Um, and I, there was not really one Kiss song that just really stuck out to me and grabbed me. It was like the whole damn album, you know. I mean, that's just such a perfect album of all the great Kiss songs from their first couple albums, right? Um, the next one that really just blew my mind was, uh, and even in more so, shaped my musical landscape forever, uh, was Black Sabbath's Paranoid album. You know, War Pigs, Iron Man. You know, the title track, can't listen to it anymore, but back in the day, uh, you know, and everything else on that album, Fairies Were Boots, so on and so forth. Um, Metallica's Ride the Lightning. I remember the first time I heard Fade to Black. I was in uh, a little store in Warwick, New York called Rock and Roll Heaven North, right? Yeah. Um, owned by 
um, the Megaforce folks, a little heavy metal record shop out in the middle of nowhere, right? And I walked in, and all I could hear was da 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 that like just opened my doors up to so many other things. Um, Dream theaters, images, and words. You know, first time I heard "Pull Me Under," blew my mind. Um, Deep Purple, the deepest purple collection LP. I don't know if any of you remember that. That was released in early 1980. You know, purple was obviously no more at the time. It had broken up a couple years before, and they released this. L album because basically a hits collection called Deepest Purple. It was tinted purple on the cover. It had a Fender Stratocaster, purple Stratocaster, gorgeous front cover painting of a Strat. And on the back, you had pictures of all the guys in the band, you know, all the different lineups and what have you. Well, except for the first Mark I uh, lineup. And a whole collection of, you know, Smoke on the Water, Highway Star, Space Truck and Burn, Storm, Stormbringer, you know, all the usual suspects. And I, you know, at the time, I kind of heard who Purple was. I was 14, you know, 1980. And I was like, I'm going to buy this because I love the album cover. And how many times did we do that back in the day? And I was like blown away. I was a Deep Purple convert from there. And uh, I just remember, you know, I loved all those songs, big time, Child in Time and, you know, Burn and uh, just great stuff. And uh, so that was, you know, some of the things that just like, totally blew my mind. I like your pick of Black Dog by Led Zeppelin because that one really got me too. Um, you know, other stuff also, like the first time I heard that first Alcatraz album, No Parole from Rock and Roll. Man, Yngwie Malmsteen. Game changer for me. Uh, I just played that album to death and then he started releasing those solo albums and I was like, holy crap, I was so into Yngwie. So into Yngwie. Great question. From Stuart Fagley. Have you heard of two bands from Louisiana where he's from, that got some acclaim, LaRue and Zebra. Fergie Fredrickson from Trillion and Toto sang with LaRue, and the guys from Zebra were in New York for a while, so maybe you saw them live. The album Up from LaRue is great, with Jeff Pollan on vocals, as is Three from Zebra. <clears throat> uh, I have never heard much LaRue, band, a name I've heard a million times over the years, never really dove into them. I probably should check them out, because um, I love Fergie. Fergie, sorry. Great vocalist. Uh, as far as Zebra, yeah, I mean, I love that. That first Zebra album is classic. Um, I like the second one too. I haven't heard uh, anything else from them. I've seen them live numerous times. They they have been a fixture on the New York concert scene for years and years and years. I saw them in a tiny club in New Windsor, New York, back in the early '90s. I've seen them in New York City. Um, yeah, Zebra's great. Gotta love. It's a very talented band. That another one of those bands that should have been enormous and, you know, never really were. But everybody you talk to remembers them and loves them, right? From Anthony Perrault. What's up, Pete? Did you ever see any of the Coffin Joe trilogy horror movies from Brazil? They are at Midnight I'll Steal Your Soul, This Midnight I'll Possess Your Corpse, and Embodiment of Evil. Love those titles. If you haven't checked them out, if you have, what do you think? I've never seen them. Uh, I, I gotta be honest. I have soured on a lot of modern horror stuff. I love classic horror. I love the you know the universal horror movies from the 40s and 30s. Uh, a lot of the cheesy horror movies from the 50s and 60s. I love the uh, you know all the, the, the Italian horror flicks from the 60s, 70s, and the early 80s. I love the classic horror stuff from the 80s. You know the slasher stuff. You know Halloween. You know Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. You know all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know the eight like I said the Italian stuff. And some stuff from the 90s, but I got to tell you the, the stuff that's been pumping out the last like two decades just lame. I think, you know, all gore, no plot, or terrible acting, or just watered down PG-13 nonsense. This kind of looks like fun. So I, I actually went on and took a look. There's a DVD that has them all. So I may go check them out. I'm sure they're pretty campy and gory and all that kind of stuff. But it looks like fun. From James Farrar. <clears throat> okay, brother, three bands, three albums, your thoughts. Iron Maiden, Brave New World. Love it. Killer comeback album, comeback album with Bruce back in the band. Big fan. Uh, in fact, I like all the albums that they've done since Bruce came back into the band with the Brave New World album. Uh, Deep Purple, Perfect Strangers. Yeah. Loved it, loved it, loved it. At the time when it came out, still really like it. 
I don't love it as much as I used to. For some reason, that album, in for me, hasn't held up as well as I would have liked it to. It still has some outstanding tracks. Also, for me, it has a couple tracks that are kind of generic sounding. Um, so I don't love it as much as I used to. I don't listen to it nearly as much as I used to. It's still a great album, yes. Um, but it's kind of it's dropped a little for me over the years. Uh, Slayer, God Hates Us All. I'm not a fan. You know, I really lost interest in Slayer after, um, from about like 94, 95 and on. And I just really haven't gotten into anything they've done since then. I've given, I've tried it all. Uh, I just, a lot of their stuff just sounds kind of repetitive and like they've been making the same album over and over again. And it just doesn't grab me like a lot of their early stuff, you know, it's, you know, Seasons in the Abyss and, and probably, probably the last album I really liked from them. So I've tried. From Scott McGregor. Hey, Pete, it's been a while. You've been around musicians long enough to know for most of them it's not an easy job. No, it's definitely not. Uh, having said that, a lot of musicians that develop a pretty good sense of humor and are some of the funniest people I know. Who are some of the funniest bands, musicians that you have rubbed shoulders with? Uh, I think Richie Blackmore might be excluded. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, and last question, have you heard any of the new album project called Bucket List with Tony Levin, Jerry Murata, and Phil Kagey? Let me tackle that first. I actually, yeah, I just listened to a bunch of tunes from that the other day. If you go onto their Bandcamp page, I got the whole album up there. You can listen to it and purchase it. Uh, pretty good. It's got a nice mix of kind of like folky acoustic stuff and some ripping, like uh, almost fusion-y stuff. Man, Phil Kagey's a great guitar player, right? It's good to hear him playing electric on that. I really dug it, so I'm going to have to listen to that more. Um, so the first part of your question about, you know, rock stars and musicians that I met who are a lot of fun, funny, nice people. Uh, I think one of the nicest guys and funniest guys I ever met was Mick Box from Uriah Heep. That guy is just, he's always smiling. He's always laughing. You know, he's like this tall. And, um, but he's just such a nice little guy. You know, he loves sipping his wine and laughing and telling stories. I got to spend a little time with him backstage at BB Kings in New York City a bunch of years ago. Really, really great guy. Um, Devin Townsend is a complete riot. That guy, I would love to just, I, I spent a couple hours with him years and years ago at Sounds of the Underground um, Festival. And we were actually, the, the festival was happening outside and I was interviewing him inside the venue, which was closed um, for the day. And he's just telling stories and cracking jokes. And they had, I think I've told this story before, they, was, they were playing MTV or VH1 videos on the big screen in there. And he was just wrecking on the stuff they were playing. Just a really fun, funny guy. Um, <clears throat> He's memorable. Um, the guys from Meshuga, Swedish extreme metal band, are a lot of fun and a total great sense of humor, all of them. Uh, I a couple times hung out with them, sitting around drinking beers and stuff like that. Uh, they're a lot of fun. Um, you know who's really nice, really witty? Carl Palmer. Really nice guy. Nice sense of humor. Um, Steve Hackett was an extremely nice guy. Um, Annie Haslam. Also, very pleasant, very uh, upbeat, nice person. There's more. There's another question coming up, and I'll get more into detail on some other stuff. From Andrew G. Dick. Hi, Pete. Thanks for answering my questions. I thoroughly enjoy your channel and have learned much from them, especially these Q&A sessions. Cool. Isn't it incredible to think it's 20 years ago today, February 10th, okay, it was a couple weeks ago, since Bruce Dickinson rejoined Iron Maiden. I think it was a much-needed shot in the arm for the band and classic metal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they needed to move on from that Blaze experiment. That just did not work. Uh, they have really grown to being a mighty metal juggernaut and, for me, reign supreme. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with me on that. What would be your favorite Maiden songs from this time period? Okay, so we're doing Brave New World and Up. Uh, some of the ones that stand out to me. So, uh, Wicker Man. Brave New World, obviously, uh, No More Lies, Dance of Death, For the Greater Good of God, Fraternity Should Fail, one of my favorites, actually, uh, The Red and the Black, Book of Souls, Death or Glory, Tears of a Clown, there's so many of them. Uh, you know, I know a lot of the old school Maiden fans don't like the newer stuff. I have never understood that at all, but I love it. I think it's good. It's different. It's more epic, right? Whatever. It's still Maiden. From L. Franklin. Hi, Pete. Love the channel and enjoy the Q&A. I asked about this a while ago and still hope it's on your list. A show about the Doom genre. Do you still plan on doing one? Are you a Doom fan? Thank you from Lee. Um, I hope to. you got to understand my list of stuff to cover on the show is immense. 
Um, so I, I have on my list the history of Doom. Uh, I'll get to it. Yeah, I love Doom. Uh, you know, Sabbath, Pentagram, St. Vitus, Candlemas, Solitude Eternus, you know, some of the more recent stuff, you know, Down, so on and so forth. I just, I love Doom. So, yeah, I, it's, I'll get to it. I'll get to it when I get to it. So much to do. From Raymond Kaiser. Pete, if you've met any rock artists, can you tell us who you thought the nicest, politest was and who was the rudest? Thank you for all that you do. Okay, so this is like kind of part two to the other question. <clears throat> Steve Hackett was one of the nicest guys I've ever met uh, from the music industry. He was just, I met him in person. He was very humble, very, very nice to me. And then I did a, and I interviewed him like a while afterwards and he remembered that moment and he was just so nice, um, really sweet guy. Mick Box, like I mentioned, super nice guy, a lot of fun. Uh, Gary Green and Derek Shulman, both formerly of Gentle Giant, super nice people. Super nice people. I got to be really friendly with Gary Green, and unfortunately I've kind of lost touch with him over the last bunch of years. I uh, hope he's doing well, because I know he had some health issues and whatnot, but I have uh, kind of lost touch with him. Very nice guy. Uh, Carl Palmer, like I mentioned, was very, very nice to me, very cool to me. Uh, Devin Townsend mentioned him before. Great guy. Uh, the guys from the sugar, Peter Togren from hypocrisy and pain, really super nice guy. Uh, Russell Allen and Michael Romeo from symphony X, actually the whole symphony X band I've met. Very nice guys. Uh, I met Mike Portnoy once. He was very nice to me. Okay. Very briefly. Um, spent some time with Kerry Livgren from Kansas. Super nice guy. I also met Rich Williams from Kansas. Very nice guy. Uh, Annie Haslam, I mentioned before. She's a wonderful lady. Uh, I got to spend some time with Roy Albrighton from Nectar, the late Roy Albrighton. He was extremely nice guy. Very pleasant to me. Uh, Stephen Wilson, I met once and interviewed in person. Very pleasant guy. Not the most talkative guy in the world. A little reserved, <clears throat> but very nice to me. Uh, as far as the rudest, I mean, most of them that I met have been very, really cool. Um, Joey Belladonna from Anthrax kind of was a dick. Um, you could he just he's he just seems like somebody's got had a star trip going on, and maybe it was just the night I met him, you know, whatever. But I I just was not impressed with him at all. Uh, and Chris Jericho from Fozzy, he's also a professional wrestler. Uh, you know, I went to see Fozzy, and I had backstage passes to go, you know, and because uh, I was there as press. And I tried to engage him in a conversation. He just could, could not give a shit who I was. And, and I actually met him earlier at a Dream Theater concert, like a decade before then. He was just hanging out in the crowd in New York City. And I tried to talk to him then, too. And he was just, like, not interested. So two bad experiences with Chris Jericho. Three times you're out, buddy. Um, from Tony Westell. Love the question and answer show. Two bands I love from the 70s haven't heard you mention. Groundhogs and Juicy Lucy. Your thoughts from Tony in the U.K.? Um, I love the Groundhogs. I have a whole bunch of Groundhogs on CD. Uh, great British blues rock band with killer guitar work. As far as Juicy Lucy, I don't own anything by Juicy Lucy. I have listened to some stuff, and I do want to get some of their material. That's, you know, Mickey Moody from Whitesnake, the band he was in before. And uh, I'm really interested in diving into them because I've had them on my radar for a number of years. I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. But uh, Groundhogs, absolutely, from Rock Fanatic. Big thanks for responding to my question. When it comes to music, I have a live and let live mentality myself and have grown a bit tired of people using music to deride each other. But hey, we're on earth, so it comes to the territory. Two questions. First, what's your opinion on the funk rock band Funkadelic? I personally think the Maggot Brain album, especially the title track, is a killer piece of work. Second, what's your favorite beer and which ones should be avoided like the HIV virus? Um, I think I've answered the Funkadelic question before. Uh, yeah, great band. I have a bunch of their albums on CD. Um, you know, Eddie Hazel, man, great guitar player, Maggot Brain Rules, great stuff. Um, really love Funkadelic. Uh, as far as uh, my favorite beers and which to avoid, well, first of all, I would own avoid anything made by Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch. Terrible, terrible stuff. Don't drink it, haven't drank it in ages. Awful. I, I never understand why people flock to that shit. It's just terrible beer. It's not even beer, if you ask me. Uh, you know, Coors Light isn't much better, although it's, you know, at least Coors Light doesn't give me a headache. Um, you know, I will from time to time in the summertime on a really hot day out by the pool, I'll drink a couple of Coronas or Miller Lights or something like that. Or, um, But otherwise, I have been gravitating towards a lot of the craft beers. So uh, as far as current favorites, 
And again, I know, depending on where you are, you may not have access to some of this stuff. But uh, the Sloop Brewery from in Fishkill, New York, makes a cool beer called Juice Bomb. It's like a very juicy, um, hazy IPA. Very good beer. Uh, I like all the Brooklyn beers. Brooklyn's a brewery in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, a lot of their beers are very, very solid. I like them a lot. Uh, we have a local brewery here called the Newberg Brewing Company. They have a cream ale and a, a very cool, like, hoppy pale ale called Nano Boss, right, which is really nice. It's also a, a local brewery in Chester, New York, called the Rushing Duck. And they have, like, 20 beers that they've created. They're canning a bunch of them. Uh, my two favorites, uh, Dad Breath which is a nice kind of like summertime lager, all right? And uh, Baby Elephant, which is like a uh, session IPA, really good. Um, I also like uh, Founders All Day IPA quite a bit. Founders makes some really good beer too. So many great beers. We could do, I could do a whole show just talking about beer. And I may just do that if any of you are interested. If you're interested, let me know because I'll, I'll happily do that. Uh, from Gene Kirsten. Great show, Pete. You were lucky to have a wife that allows you to have time for your love of music and to make videos like you do. I know, right? Pretty cool. Uh, question one. Have you heard anything from the band The Rockets from Detroit? And question two. Have you heard the 70s band Artful Dodger from West Virginia? Okay. Um, I actually saw The Rockets once, like a million years ago. I think it was 1981 opening up for REO Speedwagon in Madison Square Garden. I think they're pretty damn good. And actually, I have long wanted to get some of their stuff. Um, I don't own anything by the Rockets, but everything I've heard I've really liked. It's another one of those bands, you know, there's just so many bands out there. It's another one of those bands that I just like, I'm always saying, I should get a couple Rockets CDs, right? And I probably will at some point. As far as Artful Dodger, I had never heard of them before, but my uh, recent buddy, Jeff Young, former guitar player from Megadeth, has turned me on to them just literally like two weeks ago. Uh, he's like, have you ever heard this band, Artful Dodger? And I'm like, I never have, and I really liked what I heard. So another great 70s band, right? There's, there's so many bands from that time period there, like, you know, that uh, are there to be discovered. From James Ferrante, have you ever heard of the Black Sabbath bootleg vinyl named their Satanic Majesty's Return that was recorded at the Providence Civic Center August 12, 1980? I have not. Um, it had eight songs, including Superstar, Superstar, War Pigs in Heaven and Hell. I digitized it a while ago. Very cool. No, I never heard that. God, this has got to be so many. I should ask my buddy Chris Allo if he's got that. I'm sure he does. From Silent Wings. Hold on. <clears throat> Hold on, Silent Wings. Ugh. Doing a lot of talking here. Hi, Pete. Just wondering what your thoughts were on Billy Sherwood's work outside of Yes, such as World Trade, Conspiracy, Circa, Citizen, and Tributes. He's very prolific. Yeah, absolutely Billy is. My God. Um... I like the World Trade stuff. It's not earth-shattering, but it's very solid, accessible, kind of proggy pop rock, sort of hard rock type of thing. I dig them. Uh, conspiracy. God, I'm trying to think if I've heard all this stuff. I know the circus stuff I've heard a lot. I like the circus stuff. That's pretty damn good. I'm pretty sure I've heard the conspiracy stuff. Everything I've ever heard from him, I've liked, okay? Uh, there's so many tribute things, you know, varying degrees of success on those. Uh, Citizen, that's decent, too. I mean, most of Billy's stuff is good, you know? It may not be mind-blowingly good, but it's all very solid. And you got to, you know, you got to give Billy Sherwood credit. He has done so much to kind of help promote and keep the spirit of modern prog going and all the different things that he does. And he's a good fit for Yes, so, you know, got to gotta give him credit. Uh, and he, oh, let's see, we also have another comment from Silent Wings. Uh, just a comment on your remarks last week about Alan White. I agree, but he has pretty much retired, and Jay Shellen is on drums for most of the show now. And, he, and the tours with Jay, the 50th anniversary of the Topographic Drama Tour, were phenomenal. I feel like he is more in the Bruford mold. Alan comes out and is good for a couple songs, and then he makes the most of his time. Yeah, I mean, that's and that's the way it should be, right? Because <clears throat> I just don't think Alan can cut it on a full-time basis anymore. Jay's a great drummer. Um, that makes me wish I would have seen that tour now, right? Well, I'm sure there'll be other times. Uh, from Virtual Graphics, great show as always. I've just been revisiting Scott Henderson's Tribal Tech Catalog. The first five records at Dynamite Hectic Fusion. <laughs> Hell yeah, they are. Starting out as a Weather Report clone and coming into its own with the fifth album, Illicit. Then, unfortunately, going off in an almost free jazz kind of direction and losing momentum. Very underrated, in my opinion. What are your thoughts? Any thoughts on which album is your favorite if you have one? Yeah, I've got, um, I have uh, Face First, Dr. He, Illicit, Self-Title One, Spears, and Nomad. And, man, you can't go wrong with any of those. As far as picking a favorite, I don't know. That Self-Title One is damn good. Um, 
Elicit's great. Face First is good. I mean, they're all good. They're all really good. I remember the first, I think the first one I ever got was, uh, it's either Nomad or Spears. And I had them on cassette and I was like, wow, this, you know, and because remember, Scott Henderson was briefly in the Chicory Electric Band. That, that was my introduction to Scott. And I was like, holy crap. And then I got that Players album. Yeah, do you guys ever listen to that Players album? That's who is on that. So that's Scott Henderson, Jeff Berlin, Steve Smith. Uh, who's the other guy? Who am I? T. Lavitz, I believe, was the keyboard player. They only ever released one album, and I think it's long out of print. Dynamite, if you can get it, go go on, uh, go here on YouTube and look up Players with Scott Henderson, uh, and, and it's a fantastic album. So, but yeah, I love Tribal Tech. I just, you know, I, I, I fell in, I fell out of touch with them though. I don't know what they've been doing, uh, if anything, the last bunch of years. I know like uh, Scott Henderson has been doing a lot of, like bluesy stuff. So I don't even know if the man is still together. From NP. Appreciate you answering my weird esoteric questions every week. I'll try to make it easier today. Yeah, some of you guys don't make it easy on me at all. Uh, do you know the band Midnight Sun and their self-titled debut? Have you also heard the previous recording of this album when it was released as Rainbow Band? Which version of the album do you prefer? I have a hard time making my mind up. Okay, credit to you. I, I love when people turn me on to music I never heard before. So I had never heard of Midnight Sun or Rainbow Band, so of course I went on and listened to the Midnight Sun self-titled album, and I like that quite a bit. That's kind of like... It's kind of like this jazz fusion-y, proggy, like, kind of like a horn rock, like Blood, Sweat, and Tears of Chicago. Great artwork. I think, didn't Roger Dean do two of their albums? I think uh, did Walking Circles, too, as well as the self-titled one. Um, so anyway, I have them in my Amazon card. I'm going to order them soon. Uh, thanks for turning me on to them. As far as the Rainbow Band, so apparently what I looked up is that they were called Rainbow Band. They got a record deal. They released an album, and then, like, immediately after that, they sacked the... the um, the singer and changed their name to Midnight Sun and then put out Midnight Sun self-titled with basically most of the same tunes in a rearranged order, maybe a couple different tracks and a new singer. So I, I, I don't think you can get the Rainbow Band album on CD. Uh, I didn't go to listen to it, but I may investigate that further because some of the tracks are different unless they're just different titles. I don't know, but thanks for recommending them. I love that. I'm going to definitely pick those up. Also, NP asked, do you prefer the Amboy Dukes or Ted Nugent solo stuff? I don't know. I mean, that those first, those first handful of Ted Nugent solo albums are damn good and pretty unbeatable. So I'm gonna tilt the scale to Nugent solo early, but you know those Amboy Dukes albums are good. And you know, quite frankly, the first like two or three Amboy Dukes albums are true Amboy Duke band albums, and then those last couple are pretty much almost like Nugent solo albums. He just basically took over that band and the framework and the formula for what would become Nugent's solo career was already ever present on those last like two or three Amboy Dukes albums. But those were all strong. I like the Amboy Dukes stuff. You know, man, you can't go wrong with any Nugent from like, you know, 69 through, you know, early 80s. Just can't go wrong with it. So good stuff. From Icaro Borges. Thanks for answering my questions every week, man. Really appreciate it. Now for this week, tell us about the albums that are considered stinkers for most people, but you actually love. Are there any you can think of? Yeah, this is, this is a hard one. Um, you know, I'm going to pick a couple here that not everybody, it's not universally acclaimed, uh, stated that they're stinkers, but um, I'm going to pick two Rolling Stones albums that most people kind of either ignore or they're like, eh, they're, they're not really great albums compared to what came before it. I'm talking about Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll, which are the last two albums with Mick Taylor on them. Most people, you know, when they talk about that period, they, they talk obviously about Sticky Fingers and Exile and how, oh, yeah, nothing compares to that, those and Goat's Head Soup and Only Rock and Roll, pretty lame, weak albums compared. You know, I don't think so. I personally love Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll, both of them. And I never understood why Stones fans kind of like, you know, see those in a lower light than so many other releases. Um, so I'm going to pick those two. My, my other one, and, you know, I probably if I give this some more thought, I can come up with some more, but... I always like Kiss Dynasty. And there are a lot of people that shit on that album just because of, you know, I was made for loving you. But the rest of that album's pretty damn good, I always thought. So, um, so I, sue me. I like, I like Dynasty. What can I tell you? From uh, Todd Stevens. Hey, Pete, what is your opinion of FM Black Noise album and Klaatu, their first album? Two of Canada's less known outside of Canada's prog bands. Okay, I have the Klaatu debut. Probably need to get that uh, that Hope album, right? The second album, because I've heard a lot of people talk about how great it is. 
Um, I like the debut. I, I probably need to listen to it more. I've had it for years. I, you know, I've it never, it never completely grabbed me back in the day, but I like it. Uh, I probably need to revisit that and pick up hope. Uh, as far as FM Black knows, that's classic. Love that album. Man, Electrified Mandolin and stuff. Uh, Nash the Slash, is that his name? That's a really good album. Uh, a, a little, little known prog gem from that period, right? From Garrett Mutton. Hey, Pete, hope you're enjoying the Jethro Tull cover show. Oh, of course, yeah, I, I saw a Jethro Tull cover band a couple weeks ago. I was wondering if you've heard or of, of or own an obscure prog album called Diluvium by Enigma from 1973, A-I-N-I-G-M-A. -I -I also, what do you think of the solo albums from George and Ringo? Uh, thank you for bringing up that uh, Diluvium album by Enigma. Uh, I liked what I heard. I listened to it on the Internet, and uh, I actually ordered a copy. Very cool, like, and I don't know what year that could, from 73. Very cool, like, heavy Hammond organ, blistering guitar, hard rock, slash, prog album. Totally my cup of tea. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. As far as George and Ringo, I Have All Things Must Pass by Mr. Harrison. That's a great album. At least most of it is anyway. Um, I don't have anything else by him. I don't own any Ringo solo albums other than, like, a hits collection. It's probably all I need, so... You know, when it comes to Beatles solo stuff, uh, it's all McCartney for me. I just, I was never a huge Lennon fan. I have a Lennon, I have a Lennon Greatest Hits, I got a Ringo Greatest Hits, and I got All Things Must Pass from George. That's probably all I need from those guys. Um, from Brad, hey Pete, I only have 12 questions for you. Jeez, thanks. <laughs> um, question number one, I call perfect albums stars aligned albums. A few of mine would be Rush Permanent Waves. Alice in Chains, Dirt, Death, Sounds of Perseverance, and Voivod, Angel, Rat. Would love to know some of yours. All right. Uh, I covered some of these in the question above, but I'll run through them again. Uh, Deep Purple in Rock, uh, Rainbow Rising, White Snake's 1987 album, self-titled album, uh, UFO Obsession, uh, Rush Permanent Waves, I'll give you that one. Yep. Uh, yes, Close to the Edge, Genesis, Foxtrot, Black Sabbath, Master of Reality or Volume 4 or just about any Black Sabbath album. Uh, Dream Theater, Images of Words. Those are some of mine. I could probably come up with a lot more, but uh, that, those are some that just kind of came to mind. From Tom Fisher. Hey, Pete, great work as always. Any interest in doing a history of, of or deep cuts or top 10 on the Steve Miller band? Unless it's already in your queue. Interesting to note that Ross Valerie from Journey once was in the Steve Miller band. Oh, yeah, really early on. I, I love Steve Miller band. I probably could do that. Um, especially maybe like a... Uh, I don't know about history of, but man, I could do a top 10 song, Steve Miller, man, I think. All right. Um, from Miss Aster Dancer, what's happening? I look forward to your Q&As every week, even when I don't have a question in the queue. I always learn something new, and I just love your personality. Well, thank you, Miss Aster. Um, I want to hear your opinions, thoughts about two artists, Unitopia and the Steve Miller Band yet again. Some of you guys are on the same page. Uh, I've heard a couple albums by Unitopia. Very, very good modern prog band. Really, really good band. Uh, I dig them a lot, and there's a lot of people who like them. So, good band. Seek them out if you haven't. Their, uh, their last couple albums are pretty good. Uh, as far as Steve Miller Band, I was a huge Steve Miller Band fan when I was a, when I was a kid. Um, I remember the first album I bought from them was uh, Book of Dreams. You know, heard uh, Jet Airliner on the radio, and uh, that was like, woo! And, and I remember how enthralled I was, not only by the great songs on that album, but, man, the synthesizer work on the Book of Dreams album. It's just fantastic. Really cool stuff on there. Good mix of rockers and pop tunes and a couple country flavor tunes. And then, of course, I went and got um, Fly Like an Eagle and The Joker. And I went and bought the, you remember the White Anthology album, which was like basically like a greatest hits of those very, very early uh, psych albums that they did. Um, and I don't know, I don't think I picked up any, I don't think I ever got Abracadabra. I think by the time that came out, I was kind of like done and I still like the older albums, but I never bothered to go any further. But, uh, yeah, I could probably do a top 10 Steve Miller band songs show, I think. Um, what else we got from Bongalong? You're here again, dude, keep it down to one question per week. Everybody. Have you heard of the 1968 electronic album, The Wazard of Is? Not really rock, but was definitely part of the psychedelic movement. A counterculture take on The Wizard of Oz. Has some clever and silly lyrics with some fine Moog work by Mort Garson. I have not, dude. Um, I don't have to go take a check into that. From Scott McGregor, one more question, Pete. The two Southern Rock Barn Burner anthems, Free Bird or Green Grass and High Tides? For me, these days it's Green Grass and High Tides just because I think that it has more dynamics during the ending jam and for the vocal harmonies. 
I'm going to guess you're more of a Skinner guy. Man, you know, that's a damn tough question. I love both of those songs. Oh. Well, obviously, we've heard Freebird to death, right? So I think if I had a choice, you know, what would I rather hear today? It'd be Green Grass and High Tides because, you know, you haven't heard that as many times. And it's, they're both fantastic. They're both so similar. Um, but I still, I tell you, I still love that ending solo to Freebird, man. It's just classic. But so is the one, and so is the Greengrass solos. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Ugh. You know, if I'm going to pick today, what would I rather hear right now? This very moment. I'd rather hear Greengrass and High Tides by the Outlaws. Today. You know, if, if you're talking like, you know, historically speaking, what's which one do I like better? I'd probably like Freebird better. But which one would I rather hear would definitely be Greengrass. So, cool question. From Mark Williams. Hey, Pete. Great show as always. What's your opinion of 707? My opinion of 707 is that they are another one of those bands that came out in that time period. So what are we looking at? Late 70s, early 80s. That, along with like Stars and Angel, should have been really big and weren't. And just kind of got screwed by the record label and just never got the support they needed. Another really good kind of like commercial hard rock band that just had a lot going for them and just never really did anything. Uh, yeah, I, I like what I've heard from 707. From Jet Powers, I found a great band on the Mighty YouTube, Crawdad, Steve Gaines' band, right before Skinner. You should check them out. I have. Actually, a buddy of mine made a copy of that album on the CDR I've had for years. That's pretty damn good stuff, man. What a what a great guitar player Steve was, huh? I'm telling you, tragic loss. From Rick Labont, hey, buddy, thanks for answering my questions, and thanks for revealing more great musical gems for me to collect. Like you, I am a fan of Whitesnake. David Coverdale had many great lead guitarists. Who was your top favorite? I know this is tough because you love John Sykes, Steve I, Adrian Vandenberg, Bernie Marston, Red Beach, etc. Well, I mean, you know, it's really not a tough choice. I, you know, I got to go with Sykes um, because I'm not, I'm not necessarily picking my favorite guitar player of all of them, my favorite guitarist in that band. Although I still think Sykes probably, see the Sykes, if I was to ask, like, if I was to answer who is my favorite guitar player in general out of all those guys, um, uh, it's either Sykes or Vi, because I love Vi. But as far as, like, which of these guitar players did I like best in Whitesnake, it's Sykes by a landslide. Okay? You know, I love Dog Aldridge, Red Beach, you know, Joel Hoekstra, Vandenberg, you know, Bernie Marsden, Mickey Moody, all those guys. Great. Mel Galley. Um, but I think in Whitesnake is Sykes. In general, probably Vi. Okay, good question though. From Lizardo Fox, hi Pete, if you could be a frontman for a great band, who would you be? Robert Plant, Geddy Lee, anyone else? Uh, how about Ronnie James Dio, Ian Gillen, David Coverdale? That's who I would pick. From Bra Blake L, hi Pete, are you a fan of Aphrodite's Child? If not, you should check out the 666 album, Vangelis is in the band. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have been hearing people talk about Aphrodite's Child, that, particularly that album for ages and ages and ages, and I don't know why, I've just never gotten around to getting it. I'm actually going to rectify that situation pretty soon, because that's actually a pretty cool album, nice concept album, cool prog album, uh, great keyboard work from Vangelis on that. From Paul Adams, hey Pete, love your show, especially the top 10 songs in Q&A, your knowledge of so many genres blows my mind. Wanted to get your take on a couple of guitar players I love, the late, great Jeff Healy and Gary Hoey. All right, one thing at a time, uh, Gary Hoey, really talented player. He's done a lot of kind of cool, wacky stuff over the years, too, right? Um, you know, he's one of those guys that kind of, like, you started hearing about, you know, at the tail end of the whole shrapnel thing and what have you. <clears throat> and uh, he's got a lot of fans out there. He's a really good player, really talented player. You just don't hear enough of anymore. Uh, as far as Jeff Healy, yeah, I mean, he was he was pretty great, right? Sad that uh, he passed on. I got to see him live a couple times, and pretty mind-blowing player. Uh, it's just amazing what he could do, right? You know, here's this guy, blinds. Um, plays with the the way he you know with the guitar flat on his on his lap and just incredible what he could do, and he was a really good singer. So yeah, both great guys, great players. From Kevin, I remember you saying you were listening to a lot of Credence. Do you have a favorite album? And are are you going to do a show of top ten CCR songs? Uh, yeah, I have them on my list. I love Credence. As far as my favorite album, God, that's tough. I'll, I'll t I'll, how about I'll tell you my favorite three? I do this all the time, right? I'm always cheating. Uh, Bayou Country, Green River, or Cosmos Factory. You just can't beat those three albums, you know? And you can throw Willie and the Poor Boys in there, too, because 
That's a great album too. Man, Creedence was such a great band. So many great songs. That's going to be interesting part of trying to put that list together. From Raymond Kaiser, Pete, what is your opinion of Mark Storacci from Crocus? And do you how do you feel he would have been? Do you feel he would have been a good fit for ACDC back in '80 after Bon Scott died? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think if they were trying to really hit on a, a very similar vocal style to Bon, I think he would have been a great choice. And I always thought Mark was a pretty good singer. And you know, if he would have gotten that gig, you know, Crocus probably never would have done anything. Although it's arguable that they did anything. You know, Crocus had a pretty small window of when they were kind of popular. But um, I think it would have been a good choice. But you know, obviously it worked out for the best for uh, for ACDC with Brian Johnson, right? From Raymond Kaiser, how do you feel about meet and greets and the high prices charged for some of them? Yeah, they're out of control. They're out of control. I'm sorry, but you know, you're already you're already spending big bucks on a concert ticket, and then they want to charge you another hundred or two hundred dollars for a meet and greet to you know to get to meet the artist and you know maybe get a sign something or other or what have you, or you know maybe you get a little trinket of something or what whatever. It's just out of control. And I've heard so many people talk about how you go to these meet and greets and the the bands or artists or whatever they just they're totally like can't wait to get out of there. I mean that's not what it's all about. I mean I've heard other stories too where it's a very actually friendly you know. <clears throat> informal type of thing, but that's yeah, it, they're they're expensive. I I don't have an interest much. I mean, you know, I've I've been able to meet a lot of cool um, musicians and rock stars over the years, and I've never been that kind of like you know starstruck. Oh, I want to go to the meet and greet. Oh, you know, it's, it's never been my thing. So um, yeah, but the prices are at, the, the prices for concerts in general are out of control. But I've already talked about that in one of my rants, so I'm not going to get into it today. From Anthony Ferrara, have you ever seen the Pink Floyd tribute, The Machine? If not, go. The lead singer is Gilmore Waters mixed in one, and the keyboards will blow you away. Yeah, you know what, dude? I've, God, I've lived here my whole life, and the machine have played everywhere near where I live forever, and I've never gone to see them. I need, I, I need, I know. I need to do it. It's another thing on my list to do. For Matty Boy Walker, do you think, what with Damon Johnson recently leaving the band, that Black Star writers still have a future? I always thought Ricky Warwick, Damon Johnson, and Scott Gorham were the core of that band. Also, what's your opinion of them as a band in general? Um, yeah, he just left. Now, so here's the interesting thing. So Damon Johnson just left Black Star, Black Star Writers. Okay. In comes Christian Martucci from Stone Sour. Kind of a weird choice, but whatever. Um, however, they're now... Scott and Ricky are reforming Thin Lizzy to do like a, a tour in celebration of... Um, God, like the 40th anniversary of... God, which... Which album? God damn it. It's a bad reputation. I forget. Um, and Damon's coming back for the Thin Lizzy tour. Go figure. So I guess he doesn't want to do Black Star Writers anymore, but he's willing to do Thin Lizzy. So I don't know. But I just, you know, Black Star Writers, I guess, is going to be one of those, you know, revolving cast of characters bands. So whatever. I, I personally like them. I think they've put out some really dynamite, solid music. You know, squarely in the Thin Lizzy mold without calling it Thin Lizzy. I dig them. I dig him. From Frank, can tell me, what do you think of Tiger Lilies, Pete? No, thank you. Not my thing. Oof. No good. From Mark Williams, hello again, Pete. I'm a huge Sabotage fan and all the side projects. What's your take on John Oliva's Pain, Zach Stevens' Circle the Circle, and the Chris Caffrey solo albums? Okay. Well, as many of you know, I'm a... Um, I'm an old friend of Chris Caffrey. He and I kind of grew up together, and uh, he lives near me. I see Chris fairly often. Uh, I like Chris's solo albums quite a bit. They're all really, really solid. Um, can't go wrong with any of them, really. Uh, Zach's band Circle to Circle have some really great albums. They're really great. What's what's interesting is you've got all these guys. You know, and I love the John Oliva's Pain albums, too. They're fantastic. What's really interesting is you've got these three guys, right, who put out all these great releases either solo or with their other bands and all of them remind you of sabotage and you just would wish that they would just do sabotage again right in a perfect world i guess i don't see it happening but man it's uh, all again caffrey solo stuff oh by the way make sure you check out chris's new project with tim ripper owens and mark zonder and steve DiGiorgio called um uh, spirits of fire very very cool but yeah circle of circle believe his pain caffrey solo all great stuff Man, just do a sabotage album, guys. All right, from Mike F. Thank you for answering my questions. I know you're familiar with Frontiers Records. I see that they are releasing box sets from different artists. They did Jorn Landy in January, 
Pretty Maids this month and Harem Scarum and ten Harem Scarum and ten in the next two months. Are you a fan of box sets? Also, I think Tommy Boland's the most underrated guitar player of all time when you do a top ten songs from Boland. Um, I used to buy a lot of box sets. I don't anymore. I just don't have the room for them. And in a lot of cases, a lot of the material I already have, so why am I going to buy box sets? So, I, you know, I don't know. For me, I'm done with the box set craze. I know that was big in the 90s, and I, I still have a stack of box sets in my closet, which I never listened to. But um, but they're cool. I mean, I used to like them to get the big booklet and, you know, bonus tracks and all this kind of cool stuff. But I guess as a way for someone to get into a band and their music for the first time ever, that's a great way to do it. Because in a lot of cases, it's it's pretty complete what's in these box sets. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I, I hadn't heard that Frontiers was doing that. So, interesting. As far as Tommy Bolin, awesome. Great player. Um, dogs. <laughs> um, you know, can I do a top 10 songs from Bolin? Possibly. And uh, although he's only got the two solo albums, so it'd have to be a top 10 songs of all of everything he's done, right? And uh, possibly, but yeah, I think he's he was awesome. Uh, another sad story in the history of rock music, right? Uh, from a uh, dude, why? Hi, Pete, what's your favorite Billy Joel album? Mine is Turnstile, some great lyrics on that one. Also, what do you think of guitarist Tommy Emmanuel and Andy McKee? Um, yeah, I mean, Turnstile is great. I also, I'm, I'm a big fan of Street Life Serenader. 52nd Street, obviously. The Stranger, obviously. And you know what? An album I, I used to kind of wreck on back in the day, but man, Glass Houses is a really great album. Can't go wrong with all those. Most of those Billy Joel albums are really, really good. From Robert Stacy. Oh, and your, your question on uh, the two guitar players, Tommy Emanuel <coughs> and Andy McKee. Really good players. Um, great acoustic guitar players. I'm just not a huge acoustic guitar fan. Um, just, I don't listen to a lot of acoustic music. It's just my thing. But both of those guys are great, and they work great together. From Robert Stacy, Pete, have you heard of Tease and or Prism? And what do you think? Uh, I already answered the Tease question earlier. Uh, Prism, I answered a couple weeks ago. Very solid band. I have a Prism collection, which is very good. They had some really good material. Another band that probably should have been bigger. Um, also, what do you think of... A Revenge, the new supergroup. I think you mean A New Revenge. That's the Ripper Owens, <clears throat> Rudy Sarzo and company. Uh, I haven't heard a lick of it yet, so I can't tell you. Uh, I just know that, man, Ripper's got like three, three, you know, Ripper's got, he's got that one. He's got the three tremors thing. He's got uh, the, the thing with Caffrey, Spirits of Fire. It's like geez, Ripper Owens is all over the place now. Holy moly. Um, from Earl Joy, Pete, what's your opinion on these two British bands, Chicken Shack and Climax Blues Band? Uh, love them both. I, I like the Chicken Shack a lot. They're, you know, if you like that early Fleetwood Mac, you know, the Peter Green era stuff, you absolutely need to listen to Chicken Shack. You know, never mind the fact that Christine McVie was in Chicken Shack before Fleetwood Mac, but um, <clears throat> it's just a uh, really, really good band. And also Paul Raymond, who was later in uh, UFO and Savoy Brown, also spent some time in Chicken Shack as well. Um, great guitar playing. Really good, that early, that early blues rock from Britain. Really, really good stuff. Uh, and the Climax, Climax Blues Band were also great. You know, they had that one big hit, Couldn't Get It Right, you know, which was more of kind of like a pop tune. But, man, they, they put out some sizzling blues rock stuff on their earlier albums. Really good. I, I have most of their albums on CD, and they're all really, really good. Even the more poppy commercial stuff, really good. Um, and great guitar playing. <clears throat> from Gear Lad and Lad, I bought some of the albums that you recommended. I love the Q&A show. Cool. Would you ever consider doing a Y&T top 10 songs? You know, I don't know, man, because I always like Y&T, but I don't have a lot of their albums. And I'm only really familiar with their early, early, early stuff up to maybe like the mid 80s. And I knew they've been doing a lot of other stuff. Since. So I, I may not be the right guy to do a top 10 songs on Y&T, because if I did, it'd be all from like three albums. Um, and what do you think of the Little River Band? Do you think they would be worthy of a top 10 songs list? Again, I, I only own a Little River Band hit set. Nothing else. So unless you want me just to read the tracks from there that I know, I'm not the right guy to do a Little River Band top 10 song show. From Patrick King. Hey, Pete, what do you think of the early 80s band Zebra? I think I already answered a Zebra song. Love Zebra. From Joseph Wallace. Nikki Six like Tommy Bolin. Motley Crue would play Teaser in concert. Do you like Nectar? Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, I think so I, I don't really know what you're trying to get at with Tommy Bolin, but yeah. A lot of people love Tommy Bowl, including me. As far as Nectar, love Nectar. Great band. Miss Roy Albrighton. May he rest in peace. Uh, most of those Nectar albums, especially the 70s albums, are fantastic. 
from Mark Byers. Hey, Peter, you familiar with Leftover Salmon and Mo? Both great live acts in the whole jam band scene. What are your opinions? Uh, I've never heard Leftover Salmon, but Mo, I have a, I have a couple of Mo CDs. They're a pretty good, talented band. I don't dive into a lot of the jam band stuff, although I like everything I've heard. You know, it's one of those things that I know myself. If I were to start really getting into the jam scene, uh, I would be spending way too much money on new music because I know there's so many great bands out there. So I've been very kind of limited in what I've gone and explored as far as like the jam bands because I just know if I open up those floodgates there's no going back <laughs> seriously um, from retro hi Pete excellent show I've been a big metal fan since the early 70s my question is have you ever been to a really bad gig of one of your favorite bands <clears throat> the worst gig I've ever been to seen was Sabbath I think it was 78 and they were dire Ozzy was stumbling around the stage clearly off his head and the whole band was completely disjointed okay yeah I think I've, I've already answered this question with the Black Label Society that was uh, for me Again, they were never my favorite band, but that was probably for me the most disappointing band that I was really looking forward to seeing. And I was just kind of like, what the hell's going on here? Um, from Melora, Loves Darkness. Hey, Melora, any thoughts on Babes in Toyland? Kind of too punk and Riot Girl, maybe for you, but just checking. Yeah, not my thing. Too punky for me. I never, and she also asks, uh, do you like Black Flag? Nah, not really my thing. Yeah, I know everybody keeps trying to ask me about kind of more punk flavored bands, but it's got to know it's just not really my thing. You can keep asking, and I'll probably keep telling you the same thing. But thanks for the question. Uh, from you, Runk, well, you, you are Uncle Hank, one. Ever check out Bull Angus? Funny you should ask that, because I actually just stumbled upon Bull Angus a couple months ago, and I've been talking about doing this uh, Forgotten Favorites show all on, like, some really cool underground 70s, 80s hard rock um Proto metal and prog and you know all, all the jazz fusiony stuff that I've been discovering lately. Uh, so I'm going to do a whole show on forgotten favorites, some kind of really cool underground '70s stuff, you know, hard rock, prog, and metal, all that kind of crap. And Bull Angus is going to be discussed in that because they're a very very cool band. So that's it for today, guys. As we hit the hour and a half mark yet again so uh, make sure you visit us on the web at www.ctranquility.org we're on facebook we're on twitter we're here on the mighty youtube as often as possible so some things that are coming up um that forgotten favorite show next week or two uh, might be slow for a couple of days because i'm going to be going away on a business trip again but um we've got a alice cooper top 10 song show coming up mike antonelli's coming back on the show to help out with that we've got an iron maiden top 10 show coming up nick franco's joining me for that We've got a Jimi Hendrix Top 10 Song Show. Wild Bill, my buddy over at Comic Book Geezers, joining for that. Um, also going to do a Top 10 of the Doobie Brothers. Mike Antonelli's coming for that. The James Gang, Dan Brown from The Warehouse, joining me on that. Uh, we're hoping to have Chris Caffrey on the show sometime over the next couple weeks, talking about the new uh, Spirits of Fire CD. Uh, I've got a new product show coming up. Eh, if I can squeeze in tomorrow, I'll do that. If not, next week. Um, what else? God, so much stuff. And uh, another questions and answers in two weeks. So stay tuned for all that stuff, guys. There's a lot of stuff coming. Uh, tell your friends. Tell them to subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the better. Try and let those uh, ads play on the bottom, guys. It helps me out greatly, okay? Every every couple bucks helps, you know, keep this thing running. So don't just uh, X them out and cast them aside. If you let them play for, you know, while you're watching or listening to me, uh, it helps me out greatly. So um, I thank you for that. So take care, guys. I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.